series and, and, and it's it's love. It's love. We 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 know love. We hear love. We say love. We we love each other. We say we love each other. We say we love our families. We say we, we love our wives and our husbands and, and, and our culture has such a a warped view of what love is. And in fact online you can actually go to the Urban Dictionary. I don't know if anybody's ever been there, but it's really cool. You can go to the Urban Dictionary and in the Urban Dictionary it defines the word I love you in a few different ways. And here goes, here goes what it says about the words, I love you in the Urban Dictionary. It says, I love you. The three hardest words to say in the English language. Words misused in the culture, mostly by men to get in bed with women. I love you means I actually lust after you. I love you is the sweetest thing that one person can tell another. I love you is no absolute meaning in the words. It's merely subjective. I love you. Our culture is so warped. Does it have meaning? Is it merely subjective? Does the word love actually have have some sort of context that can be used in our life? The actual dictionary defines love as an intense feeling of deep affection. A deep feeling of romantic or sexual attachment to someone. God's word describes love in a totally different manner than this. Uh, 1 Corinthians 13, it is is essentially called the love chapter. This is where we're going to get this series from, from in 1 Corinthians 13. So you're going to go with us on a journey through 1 Corinthians 13, and I hope you're that that's exciting. First Corinthians 13, starting at verse 1, and it says this, Though I speak with the tongues of men and angels, but have not love, I have become sounding brass or clanging cymbals. I'm going to stop there. That's what I'm going to talk about this morning. Though I speak with the tongues of men and angels, but have not love, I am sounding brass or clanging cymbals. The, the, most, the most supreme power of utterance that we're able to comprehend, translating every language on earth or, or the languages of, of the angels in heaven, being able to translate those, being able to, to speak in, in all these different languages. There were certain priests that were a part of the, the temple and they were able to translate different languages and they were thought of very highly and they were respected very well. And, and, and Paul says to them, I don't care if you can translate every language on this earth or even being able to translate the the angels in heaven that means nothing if you don't have love right okay so I don't care how smart you are I don't care how great you think you are it means nothing without love in fact it means the same as somebody taking a symbol and literally you know just just taking a symbol and just literally you know just just I, I, I just love doing that you know I feel like a little kid again it, it's it's unintelligent it's obtrusive. It's, it's mere discord. It means absolutely nothing. It says you being so smart, being so spiritual without love means nothing. It's unintelligent. It's obtrusive. It means nothing. The second aspect of this sounding brass or clanging cymbals is, is, is these were things, these were instruments that were used in heathen worship ceremonies to their deities. Essentially what Paul is saying is, is if we love, if we say we, we love each other, then, then, then we act different. If we can speak with all, these, all this wisdom and we act so spiritual, it's, it's nothing. It's just like every other religion on the earth if we don't have love. Ooh. Without love, our religion looks like every other religion. I'm talking about real love. I'm talking about this agape love that he's talking about here. This this love, agape love. I say that and somebody goes, I don't know what you're talking about. Agape love is is literally a a love that, that wants nothing in return. It's, it's a love without change. It's a, it's a self-giving love that expects nothing. It's a love that, is, that, is, that is, is, is so great that it is given to unlovable people. That's, that's that agape love. 
It, it gives because it wants to, not because it needs anything in return. You know what I'm talking about? You, you know, no, that's, that's not normal love. That doesn't make sense. That love isn't, isn't fathomable. That's exactly, that's exactly the love that he's talking about. It's an agape love that you give to unlovable people. It's a sacrificial love. It's about giving, uh, about giving love and not getting anything. It's not emotion. There's no emotion to it. It's actually a self-denial for the sake of others. Our definition of love in the Urban Dictionary and our dictionary, our definition of love is tied to emotions. It's all about the, the emotion behind love. God's definition of love says it has nothing to do with your emotions at all. It's about you denying yourself and your emotions and giving what needs to be given, right? Our words have to be, become more than, than what people are doing wrong. We say we're spiritual. We say we got this thing figured out. We are, we are very wise in our spirits. We, we do things right and we look at people and we say, don't do this, don't do this, don't act like this, act like this, do this. How can we, how can we tell people that, that our God is alive and living and that our, 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 our Jesus loves them and then they look at us and they expect to see something different than they do from every other religion in the world, right? Here's what Jesus said about that in John 13. John 13 verse 34 says, A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another as I have loved you. You also love one another. 35. By this, I wonder what he meant by by this. Probably by this, right? <laughs> by this concept, this new commandment that I'm giving you, this love one another as I've loved you, even so you should love one another. By this, by this concept, all will know that you are my disciples if you have love one for another. What sets us apart? What makes us different? Well, Pastor, it's the power of the Holy Spirit upon us. No, it's not. The power of the Holy Spirit upon us shares the love of Jesus through us. Amen. Well, Pastor, it's the fact that we have God's Word, and it's real, and it's alive, and it's living. Yes, and it's sharp, and it cuts you when you don't love, and it cuts you to love, right? Right? This is what sets us apart. It's not, it's not that we do things right or that we have everything figured out. It's the fact that Jesus loved us so much and then looks at us and he says, I love you so much. Now the only thing that's going to set you apart, the only thing that's going to make you any different in the world, the reason that people are going to know you are mine is if you love one another. Yeah. What? That's crazy, right? Like, that doesn't make sense, right? Jesus, how about make us smarter than everybody else? That would be really easy, right? You know, if I was just really smart, you know what I mean? That would, be, that would be really easy. People would know you're my disciples if you're smarter than everybody else. And you've, you've worked hard and you've trained yourself and you, you're theologically sound. People will know you're my disciples. No, no. How about give us really cool singing voices, God? You know, Jesus, we could just walk around singing all day. And then people will know you're my disciples when you sing, right? How about make us different color from everybody else? You know, make me green. You know, when people will know you're my disciples because you're green. No. How about something that relies upon you to show other people that you're different, that you're his, that you've accepted his love, so in return are willing to give that love to somebody else. People will know you're his by your love for one another. Whoa! Becoming just like every other religion. We look like every other religion in the world, right? What, what makes your religion right? Everybody's moral. Everybody's good. Everybody has values. Everybody's... What makes your religion set apart? What makes you so right and us so wrong? Well, it's because we love Jesus. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through Him. And we say, hallelujah, that's what makes us right. Okay, being right is one thing. What sets you apart from every other religion? It's your love one for another. Amen. Amen. Right? Amen. I can tell by service three, this is, I, I'm going to have no voice. I'm going to be screaming at people. Right? 
Islamic love is to love God's friends and to hate his enemies. That's what the Islamic love is. Islam teaches us in the, the Ibad number 5, 125, to love God's friends and to hate his enemies. Jesus looked at his disciples in Matthew 5, 43. He says, you've learned, you shall, you've heard it said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemies. But I say to you, love your enemies. Bless those who curse you. Do good to those who hate you. Pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. That you may be sons of your Father in heaven. He makes the sun rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain to the just and on the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Not even tax collectors, even the wicked people of, of our time love the people that love them. Our concept of love is warped because we live in a culture that allows it to be warped. Every other religion teaches us Buddhists and Hindu. They teach a, a love, a sensual love. You, you, you've heard of the Kama, you know, that, that's the Hindu, Buddhist way of loving people. It's a sensual thing. It's not this agape love. It's, it's, it's about me. It's not about God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. Whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. It's not sensual. It's I'm giving you something because I love you and I don't care if you ever respond to it. I want you to know that there is love for you. We have a, a, a religion that says love those who love God, hate those who hate God. We have a Savior that looks at us and says, love those who love God and love those who hate God. Bless those who persecute you, who talk junk about you, who, who flip you the bird whenever you're driving down the road. You bless those people and you love those people. What separates us from every religion in the world? What makes us stand apart so that we don't sound like a clanging cymbal? What makes us be different is the fact that we love each other. Listen, God is love. And if we are going to be set apart and look different than everyone else in the world, then we need to love. What makes us different? How, do we set up, how, do, how are we set apart? It's not your spirituality. It's not your theology. It's your love. 1 John 3 16 says, By this we know love, because He laid down His life for us. We ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. Mm. Whoever, in this, whoever has this world's good and sees his brother in need and shuts up his heart from him, how does the love of God abide in him? My little children, let us not love in word or tongue, but in deed and in truth. And by this, I don't know what he means by by this. <laughs> by this, by this love that you'll have for one another, by this willingness to give of yourself very unselfishly, by this, we know that you are of the truth and shall assure our hearts before him. What separates you? What makes you different? It's not your spirituality. It's not how long you how long you've known Christ or how, how smart you are with his word. It's all of that is great, and I don't want to minimize all of that through this series, but today I want you to understand that we've become so focused on what we can do and what we can accomplish. And, and, and God's word is looking at us, Jesus is looking at us. Again, Paul now is looking at us and he says, If you want to be known as one of mine, here goes the way to do it. Love one another. If you want the world to see you for who you truly are and to see you for who I have, I, have, I have become inside of you, here goes what you should look like. You should look like a loving individual. 1 John 4, 19 says, We love Him because He first loved us. 
If someone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. Mm. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen, how can he love God who he has not seen? And this commandment we have from him, him being Jesus Christ, that he who loves God must love his brother also. Listen, this is, this is, this is what it's all about. I love you. I don't, I don't just say that. If any of you were to come up to me after church and say, Pastor, I need your jacket, I would give it to you gladly. I love you. I, I don't, there, there's, there is nothing in this world that, that I could see that would stop me from loving you. There's times I look at you and I think, oh, God, the person drives me bonkers, you know? You know what I'm talking about, right? You're like, not the preacher. No, he don't think like that too, right? Yes, yes he does. I love you, but there's times where humanity in itself is frustrating, right? I was driving down the road yesterday, and I was leaving one wedding, trying to get home for lunch, and then we, we had to go somewhere else, and then get back, and then I had to go to another wedding. So yesterday I was just rushing really bad, and... And, and I get really frustrated when people drive in the fast lane slow. I, I don't know why that is. I think, if, I think when, God, when God reveals the fullness of His Word, we're going to find in here somewhere, some scripture that says, fast lane set up for fast drivers and the slow lane for slow drivers. Please follow those commandments. I don't know where it is yet, but I'm searching hard for it. So this person, this, this truck was driving in the slow lane and then this, you know, I don't get frustrated with the person, in, I mean in the fast lane, I don't get frustrated with the person in the slow lane because they're in the right lane, you know. So, so, so I'm, I'm kind of frustrated and I'm like, I wish you would just move and, and, and I'm, I'm in a rush to get home. And, and so, so this car in the, in the slow lane finally gets off the road and they turn. And so, so I just kind of nicely, politely went around this car that was driving in the fast lane. And I guess he thought I went around him too quick or whatever. So he pulled up to me at the next stoplight and, you know, shot me a bunch of birds and told me how terrible I was and rolled down his window. And I just rolled down mine. And I was like, you serious, man? You, you, you're serious right now. You're, you're upset at something I did. I passed you in the slow lane. I didn't run you off the road. I didn't honk the horn. I wasn't tailgating you. You're upset because I passed you in the slow lane. He's like, man, you're driving like a, like a crazy man. And so much inside of me wanted to revert back when I was 19 years old and put a car in park and you see a crazy man? I will show you a crazy man! I don't think so. But I was sitting there and the Holy Spirit quickened my spirit and he said, what are you preaching on tomorrow? And I said, you will shut up right now. I don't want to hear this, Holy Spirit. I want to be mad at this man. No, I said, preach on love those who do you wrong so they see Jesus inside of me. Everything inside of me wanted to park the car, pull over in that, you know. I don't know what I would have done when he pulled over, but... <laughs> Listen, man, I got three kids. Don't hurt me, you know. <laughs> Everything inside of me wanted to act in a very human nature. But I know the only thing that could set me apart in that young man's mind from the rest of the world is to show him love. So I tried my best to. I drove away from that moment and I thought, God help us. God help us that we are so consumed with our life and how things revolve around our life and how things look in our life that we never stop to look and say, how can people see Jesus Christ inside of me? It's easy to show you Jesus. Because I love you, you love me. It's easy for me. You know, we're a happy family. A great big hug and a kiss from me to you. Sorry, I have that issue. It's easy for me to show you love. 
and you to show me love. But it's really difficult when people who don't love me, who are saying nasty things about me, for me to look at them and say, you know what? I love you. You need something? I'm going to give it to you. You, you want... Okay, here, let me help. You, you, yeah, here, let me, let me be there for you in that moment. Then all of a sudden, people look at you like you're crazy. And they say, what is wrong with this person? I was mean, and I was hateful, and I was rude. Now all of a sudden, this person is showing me love? What is going on with this person? All of a sudden now, you have done something in your life to separate you from the rest of the world. See, we will never, ever, 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 ever outperform the world. The Carolina Opry has way better music than us, way better lighting system, way better atmosphere. You know, they even got little cup holders, nice chairs, you know, way better atmosphere than us. Walmart has way better hospitality and, and, and way better marketing than us. The Fun Warehouse has way cooler things for your kids to do. The Shriners are way better at an assimilation process of getting you through their system. We can't compete with these people in those categories. But our job and our responsibility isn't to be like them. Our job and our responsibility is to be like Christ. And if we're to be like Christ, then those things, as great as they are, and, and, I, and I hope every level of our church gets better, but ultimately the reason that they get better is because we fall in love with people. Yes. The reason our worship gets better is because we fall in love with people and we want to lead them to the throne of grace, right? Amen. The reason our hospitality gets better is because we fall in love with people and we want them to know how important and how valuable they are, right? The reason our kids' program gets better is because we fall in love with people and we see how valuable their children are and the next generation is. We don't want to act like the world. We want to act like Jesus Christ. And by acting like Jesus Christ, it makes us fall in love with people. And by falling in love with people, it makes us want to be excellent in everything we do for the kingdom of God, right? Mm -hmm. Listen, I, I, I desire to see God's Spirit poured out. I desire to see God do amazing things in our church. I desire to see our church go to a completely different level. But here goes, here goes my, my warning. Sometimes spiritual people oftentimes have an arrogance about them. Why aren't you acting like this, you know? I've got it figured out. Why are you struggling with this sin? Just, just do different. Just act different. Why, why, are you, why is that person able to do that in the church? They're not where I am spiritually. I don't think they should be able to, to do this. Here's my warning to us. As we grow deeper in a relationship with Christ Jesus and as our, as our walk becomes more authentic with Him, I pray and I hope and I plead with you that our spirituality, do, spirituality doesn't become clanging symbols. Because without love, our spirituality is just noise. I hope and pray that as we become deeper in our relationship with Christ and as we draw closer to Him, that our spirituality is mixed deeply with love, rooted in love, so that our spirituality mixed with love can truly bring a revival to this community. My desire is to have a real, authentic, powerful move of God's Spirit where spiritual people become loving people as well and understand that God has sent us to a world that is lost and dying and to love on them and to support them and to help them. God, help us to love one another because you first loved us. Were you worth loving? Nah. I mean, let's be honest. Was I worth loving? No. 
Was I worth Him giving His Son on a cross? No way. Was I worth... No. But God, we love You. Because You first loved us. And that sounds great. But Your Word says that we love each other because You first loved us. Wow. Stand with me. Father God, I pray right now for an increased love inside of us. A love that is not emotional. A love that isn't tied to what we desire and what we want. But God, a love that above all else wants to love the people that you love.